answer is yes. Okay, so um, let's um, have Emmanuel de Stasse presenting, uh, preparing your applications for Internet of Things. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, can anyone, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, my name is Emmanuel Nastasa. I'm uh, currently technical team lead at Locksoft. Just as a quick background, uh, my experience is in different application oriented or business oriented applications over the networking protocols or networking layer um, and with various applications. So, what I would like to talk today to you is about preparing your application for the Internet of Things. And the first point that I would like to make is that Internet of Things is not a, a new concept. It's, it's just good marketing. And this is because if you look at it, Internet of Things, what it, Internet of Things tries to bring is having multiple devices or things that are not beings that communicate with one another. But we already have this. We already have a lot of systems that communicate with one another. The only thing that the Internet of Things brings to this is the consumer into the question. So one of the classical examples in Internet of Things are like, for example, you're in your car, you're driving, you have a crash. Then the car has somehow a system right there in the middle that somehow knows exactly how to receive the details of the crash, then gets the owner information from your phone, like, I don't know, social security number, uh, your medic, your physician, then maybe get some health information from your smartwatch, and then notifies the emergency system. If we look at a similar diagram that we currently have, and probably many developers are familiar with, is the quality assurance system that you have in place. So basically, one use case is we probably have a Jenkins or a CI server that performs builds regularly, and sometimes a crash may appear. That crash can notify a different system that, for example, interrogates other systems about what are the details of that crash. For example, SonarQ, which is a tool for static analysis, gets the details and then opens an issue. If we look at a comparison about of how the interaction between these systems look like, the familiarities are struggling. I mean, you have the same type of interaction. You have a central system that knows how to communicate with other systems in order to maybe notify a different system. So you have a, a few systems that are emitters that somehow emit signals systems that provide information, and systems that you can alert. So what IoT bring, brings into play now is the importance of having a real context around your application. You're not, you're not developing applications that you're only using for your own benefit. Your application now begins to be in a global context. It can be used by many other applications, many other uh, users or uh, devices. And this, this brings a question of, OK, how can we manage all of this? How can we not became, avoid being trapped in the dependencies? Another important thing that IoT brings to play is the importance of technology is minified. You have a lot of devices with a lot of programming languages into them, with a lot of technologies, and you have mainly, you have almost uh, a technology for every type of problem. So you could have uh, devices that ha uses, use C sharp or use C. You can have devices that use Java. You can have devices that are, I don't know, scripting languages like Python, Perl. And it doesn't, it's, it's not as important of what technology you use, but how that interaction between them comes to play. So let's look at what happens with an application. So right now, when you develop an application, a typical use case, you have a server and you have a client. And you're developing that server. You, you are building uh, 
some infrastructure for it, you are building some functionalities. For example, let's say you build an application that helps you manage a shopping list where you put what you want to buy. And for the moment, you only make a mobile client. In the future, maybe that application can also connect to your fridge to know exactly what ingredients or what, uh, what you want to buy, what you don't have in the fridge right now. Like, for example, it can notify you you're running out of milk. Then, in the future, a consumer for your application can appear, like, for example, Del Heise or another supermarket that wants to know what's, what is the pattern of uh, shop for shoppers in a specific region. And this can quickly explode to an app from a simple, a really simple app to an app used by multiple uh, third parties. Like, for example, Media Pro can interrogate to see exactly what kind of products are bought in a specific region to know exactly what kind of uh, commercials to display on the TV. Uh, the car, the car can connect to your shopping list to also identify what's the quickest path to get. Uh, to get you to buy all the items that you have in your shopping list. Or can, it can connect to maybe the, te to the television. And based on what kind of commercials you were aware of, uh, it can notify you with uh, shopping, uh, let's say, tips. Or it can connect to your oven and say, OK, you just bought a new oven. This can cook different recipes. The main problem with this is coupling. So you just started out with a simple application. It just got used by a number of different clients. And you still want to have the freedom of changing things, the freedom of building new features into that application. One thing that you have to keep in mind is how can you build the architecture on your side, on your, let's say, how do you build up features and things like this. So, if you look at the rows of chairs right now, you have a, le a similar layout like this. So if you have a lot of different classes or modules or components that interact one with, an, what, with, each, with each other, if you want to change something at the very top level, it will automatically propagate all over your application. So, so you don't want this. You don't want to have the difficulties of changing. So one, things, uh, one important thing is to modularize, to have in your application very specific layers or very specific delimitations of features. For example, for a shopping list, you could have something that is an adapters layer that all, only knows how to connect to different uh, information providers. Or you could have a layer that only, only deals with managing the shopping list. Another module that only deals with uh, getting tips and tricks and uh, maybe adv advertising and things like this. One thing that helps and is more important now than ever is fo following a really good set of principles when you're building your app to avoid being trapped by the fact that you have multiple co customers. And some there are some principles that are used in object-oriented programming that can easily be made general in a way that they speak to systems. So you can look at systems that, as objects. These are the solid principles. In theory, if you follow these, you will end up with having a very uh, robust system that it's, it, it isn't prone to failure and that you can easily extend. So single responsibility principle, this is a, if you look at the object, it says something like an object can only do one thing. But this can be very easily abstracted at systems. A system should only deal with only one responsibility. This way, you will end up maybe, if you start with a simple system that only deals with one business scenario, and you want to extend that feature, maybe it's better to have multiple subsystems that somehow connect at the very top level and expose that functionality and not putting everything in only one. Another one important is open close principle. And this image says something like open chest surgery is needed when putting on a, it's not needed when putting on a coat. 
a very familiar scenario that we found in production is you start out with, the, with, with a simple app and as you add features to it you constantly change the code that you already put in. You should avoid this at all costs. You can, if you have a view of your system as modules then adding a new feature, addressing a new business need can just be mapped as adding a new module to your app. Let's cover substitution principle. This, this deals with having abstraction, abstraction levels. So for example, in a system you tend to communicate with other systems to get information. And to deal with those systems, you, most, of the, most of the time you use a middleware or you use an abstraction layer. And that abstraction layer should not add any other new information and it should not edit the behavior of the thing that it abstracts. Interface aggregation principle, this deals with having things broken up into pieces and so limiting the dependencies of systems. If you have, for example, if you go back to the first picture, like let's say this one. Here you will expose a contract to Delhaize, but maybe in the future w w as your application goes further and further and has new functionalities, the technologies that you used are not going to respond well to the requirements. Or maybe you want to change from Java to C because it's faster. Or maybe you want to do something inside of your server. What interface uh, does, what it's saying programming by interface is you have to put a layer of abstraction between them. Oh, I was at interface aggregation. Yeah, this, this deals with the modularization of the application. So uh, not exposing all the features as a whole. If you look at, uh, let's say, Facebook. Facebook has a lot of applications, but you don't deal with them in the same API. You have multiple APIs, you have sub-APIs, and you have everything split up into separate modules. Uh, Previously I was talking about dependency inversion, which means having a system put in the middle of two systems and having both depend on them. So all of these, all of these uh, principles that you have to put in place helps you follow, helps you obtain the hiding of implementation. So one use case that we talked about is how can we ensure that we can change our entire implementation of the server side? How can we change the entire implementation of our uh, services or our functionalities without breaking the clients? Having multiple clients connect to you, like, I don't know, cars and other devices, will uh, at a point be force you to respect all those contracts. So you'll be, end up having your application like in a jail you cannot evolve without breaking the connection between them. So what you can do is break those things up in contracts. And this is a very common pattern that you have right now in production. And it's the same in the context of IoT. I don't know how many of you tried doing things in your home with Raspberry Pis or, uh, okay, so two of them. Okay. And how hard was it to extend that functionality to maybe include other types of sensors or uh, maybe change a couple of them? The main benefit of this, of following the contract, is you only depend on the contract. So basically, you, des you describe a list of services that you expose that other clients can expect from you. And your implementation only depends on that contract. This enables you to maybe have multiple contracts exposed by your application that maybe is implemented in the same server or multiple servers that you can extend very easily. Another key aspect is integration using a top-down perspective. And here we can have, we have a small comparison about 
top down and bottom up. Top down says start always start with what you want to provide. What are the functionalities that your application should expose, your server should, should expose. Bottom up starts from how, what technologies will I use and what can I do with those technologies. Going from top down, you can see that it's far more easier to extend things, to add more functionalities, but most of the time, and what a uh, common use case that we found in production is not always what you think of design or what your design was can be implemented using the technologies that you choose. So this, is a, this can be a risk, but this can be overcome by experience. By using bottom-up, you always know that what you wanted to do can be implemented, but in the end, it can be very hard to extend those functionalities. So the most important question that you need to ask yourself is, what is the business provided? And most of the times, when you see interactions between systems, you can see that uh, people think that systems provide data or, or maybe low-level information. Like, for example, if you want to connect to a thermostat, what would be the business exposed by that thermostat? If you say, OK, that thermostat exposes uh, only uh, the temperature, that's just some data. You can think about having maybe a list of, uh, you can expose a service in which you can subscribe to different alerts, like uh, only register when the temperature is above 10 or 6. This way, if you choose to change the implementation of the thermostat, it's not going to be impacted. If the, for example, if the features the next features will include also maybe humidity and other things. It's not going to impact the data, the data source that you put outside. The complex systems are systems that use multiple simplistic systems, let's say. And simplistic systems can be, for example, sensors, which most of the times have maybe only one on-off switches or only simple functionalities. And complex systems, what they do, they just aggregate all the functionalities, the minimum functionalities that the simplistic systems expose in order to create an ecosystem. What would be the best case scenario in order to obtain this, uh, what is called now IoT, and what is the great difficulty, the, the biggest challenge in obtaining this is having this system connect one to each other and understanding how they should connect and what is the business provided and having that intelligence, uh, that IE uh, framework or tool that enables you to actually determine what are the systems available, what you can use from them, how you can connect them, what is the data that they accept, what is the data that they will output and automatically build these systems. Only then we can maybe truly talk about the uh, true IoT. And one last word would be, uh, this is a quote that uh, I've heard and I really liked, is that processes ensure predictability and the quality of delivery. Design and development principles determine the future, and in the end, the team saves the day. So even if you have the best design, even if you have the best processes, and you don't have the right team, you cannot go to that end and implement it. Thank you. We have, yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding to what kind of protocols can we use for communication between Internet of Things with mobile? Because we have mobile now, Android, iOS, and uh, Windows Phone. So, unique. Any any suggestions? Okay. So, one important thing that uh, I think it's very imp one important thing that we need to follow in IoT is having the most general way of communicating because. When you have a service, when you expose a service, you don't really know from the start what the clients are going to be, how they are going to look like. So you must 
one thing, one protocol that I think it's the most general one and that every device can have is HTTP and maybe use other services like REST or SOAP or things like this. This is a very easy to implement protocol and only by connected to the internet you have access to it. So I think this is the more general way. Then you could have more specific protocols for maybe use cases like you could have a near field if you have something that you can actually use your phone to go into something in a building or a, a restricted area or other more specific protocols. But I think that HTTP is probably the best bet right now. H HTTPS. Uh, or HTTPS, uh, yeah. You know, you know, in iOS 9, we're going, um, uh, they, they're going to have HTTPS as default. And Sorry? Gonna, in iOS 9, we're going to have HTTPS as default. And if you want to connect to HTTP, you need to ask for exception. So yeah. The other way around. Any other question? Any other question? Oh. <laughs> No? Okay. We're going to have a five minutes break and then we're going to continue with the next session. Thank you. Thank you.